Hey everyone, so this is a lecture to go with week three of Intro GIS. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk today um, about a couple of different reminders of um, more topics on cartography. We're gonna talk more about vector data, which we talked a little bit about last week and you've seen in lab. Um, a little refreshers on joining data and refreshers on uh, selection, and then just a brief intro into what the lab is gonna be like this week, which is focused on geoprocessing. So essentially taking vector data and creating new shapes of vector data um, rather than in the selections that you've done, which are sort of selecting from an existing uh, sets of vector points, lines, and polygons. All right, so first thing um, is to take a look at this figure. This is related to cartography. Um, and the reason it's related to cartography is that most everybody will be able to see this uh, square over here. And that's because the distinction between green and yellow um, tends to be pretty clear for, uh, for most people. But some of you might have a hard time um, or even an impossible time of distinguishing this red circle over here. And that is because red green color deficiencies uh, happen to a substantial portion of the population. So especially uh, male, the male population is something like 5%. The male population has some level of red green color deficiency. Um, so here's another example of that, that, uh, you know, folks that, uh, that don't have red green color deficiency can squint at this and, and kind of see a shape in there. Um, and folks who do have trouble distinguishing between red and green are never going to be able to, to make that out. Um, and so this is just some Wikipedia screen captures of what these different colors might, uh, might look like. So the left side is what someone without um, any red, green color blindness or color deficiency would see in terms of a rainbow. Um, and the right side is a mock-up for those of us who don't have color deficiency of what those same colors might look like. Um, and so you can see that, you know, these ones on the top in the, the red, orange, green are kind of fading to a similar hue, which makes them really hard to, to see. And so why does that matter in terms of cartography? It matters for cartography because, uh, you know, red and green is a, are a very tempting, you know, especially in terms of the sort of like uh, stop and go, you know, if you think about stoplight colors or, um, you know, good and bad as sort of like intuitive colors for kind of, you know, green means go and red means stop type of things, they can be really tempting to put on a map. Here's a map from, <laughs> this is actually from quite a while ago. I imagine these numbers would be a lot higher these days in terms of uh, home sale prices in different states. Um, but, you know, this is a, a common form of map, which is one that uses red and green. And so just to be aware that uh, about 5% of the population will have, a, will have a really hard time understanding and interpreting a map if you go with uh, red and green colors. So choose wisely when you're thinking about um, these type of what we would call this in, uh, in cartography is a divergent color scale, which is one where you go from one color at one end to another color at the other end, um, as opposed to a graduated color where you'd start with, you know, you'd have the same hue throughout. So just be mindful of divergent color scales that include red and green. All right, moving on to just that refresher. We've already talked about points, lines, and polygons. We're going to talk about them some more right now of what are these things, right? So points. Points are a single dot in space, so they're going to have a geographic location. And the points are, uh, you know, depending on the data set, um, they're going to have whatever attributes are associated with that. So you could have tons and tons of attributes, um, as many as you can think of, associated with any specific point, specific location in geographic space. 
Um, but what a point is never going to have, a point is never going to have uh, distance associated with it because it's just one location. A point is never going to have area um, associated with it because it's just a single location. Um, so in order to get those things, we need to go to a different data type, a different vector data type. So a line um, also has specific geographic locations. Um, it's going to be, uh, this says arc, but really in, uh, in GIS, all lines and also the edges of all polygons are made up of straight line segments between vertices. Um, any line that you have in your data set can have those same attributes. So just like a point, your lines can have um, attributes. Uh, the, the extra thing that lines have that points don't have is going to be direction and length associated with them. So you can measure distance with a line. Okay. Some this stuff is pretty intuitive, I think. Polygons are enclosed spaces. They, just like points and lines, have specific geographic locations. So polygons are also built on vertices. So they're built on points with specific geographic locations. Uh, what a polygon has that lines and points don't have are area, right? They have a shape mm -hmm. defined. Um, and so you can measure area uh, and shape associated with polygons where you can't do that with lines and points. And just to um, think a little bit more about what a polygon actually looks like relative to points and lines, if you zoom way in on, uh, uh, this is a towns in Massachusetts, if we zoom way in on the edge of this town, you can see that the polygon is built on these vertices, so a bunch of points which are connected by straight lines. So points, lines, and polygons are sort of, you know, like to get to a, to get to a line, you need to have at least two points to get to a polygon, you need to have at least three points and lines connecting them to define a shape. Um, for some of these, and I would say particularly for points and for polygons, there is a choice in terms of which of those you might want to use, right? So here are a bunch of points um, marking a bunch of different houses in this neighborhood. So why would we choose points uh, instead of polygons, right? Because we could also define the shape of each of these houses in the different neighborhoods. Uh, polygons can have all of the same attributes that points have, right? So why would you ever go with a point instead of a polygon? Um, the answer to that, I, 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 would, I can come up with two answers to that. The first is that it's a lot easier if I were digitizing something and marking locations on a map, it's a lot easier me, for me to click points than to go in there and meticulously measure the edges of each of these houses. For example, if I was digitizing a thousand houses, I would be a lot happier if I could do that with points as opposed to with polygons. The other piece is, uh, data storage size. So if you have a thousand points, then that takes Arc Pro, um, whatever, <laughs> whatever it takes um, to store those single geographic locations, single vertices, um, whatever you see in the attribute table, plus the, the geography underlying it. When you add polygons to that though, you add an additional piece where this is not storing just the single location, but it's actually storing a specific location associated with each of the vertices in each of these polygons. So in this case, if you had a whole bunch of rectangles um, and your polygons were all made of four vertices, then sort of by definition, you need to store four times the amount of information to um, gather these polygons than you did for just the point locations. So unless you really need area, and many times you do need area, unless you need to define something about the shape in the area, um, then oftentimes points are easier and less uh, and take up less storage than, uh, than polygons. Lines uh, are tend to be pretty intuitive, right? So uh, if you need to show, define a neighborhood, um, define things that are kind of linear, like roads or rivers or something like that, 
um, then lines are often the way that we do those things. But there's also a question between lines and polygons too, right? So if you needed to uh, define how to get from point A to point B along a bunch of roads, then a line is gonna do that just fine for you. But if you needed to measure you know, how much uh, asphalt do I need to repave all of these roads, um, then you would probably want a polygon to define the full extent of, um, of how much surface area of road you want. So depending on the question, you may change your answer as to whether you want to use points, lines, or polygons. There they all are. Um, some advantages thinking about vector data are that they are going to look the same. And this is advantages of vector data, I should say, relative to raster data, which you're seeing um, underneath. You know, So this is a raster aerial photo in grayscale that we're zooming in on here in this neighborhood. Your points are going to look what, like whatever the symbology is that you've chosen for your points, so green green circly like things in this case, they look the same no matter what zoom you are, uh, you're zooming in on. Raster data do not, right? So raster data, as you start to zoom in further and further, you end up with this pixelation effect uh, where you start seeing those little squares, square pixels that make up the base of raster data. So looking the same, no matter what your zoom is, that's an advantage of vector data. Another big advantage of vector data, um, if you are needing to change the coordinate system or change the projection of your data sets, and I should say we're going to talk about this lots more next week in week four when we talk about projections um, and in, uh, in lab four. Uh, but points, so because all of all vector data are based on points, so whether those are actual points in a point shape file or whether they're vertices in a line or a polygon file, a uh, point does not have area. It doesn't have a shape, right? It's just a, a point. And so because it has no area, because it has no shape, um, because it doesn't have any direction or anything like that, it cannot be distorted. So you can't distort a point no matter if you, you know, turn it upside down, look at it sideways, which are all things that you would do potentially as you're changing coordinate systems. If you come back to the original way that you were looking at it, it's gonna look exactly the same because there's no way to distort the shape of something that has no shape. That's different from raster data because raster data are built on rectangular, sorry, square, <laughs> also rectangle, square pixels. And squares do have shape, they do have area, they do have distance and direction. All of those things can be distorted when you change coordinate systems. So in raster land, it's very uh, unsafe, I guess, to change your coordinate systems a bunch of times because you actually distort the quality of your data set. So that's a like thinking point for, for next week and for future weeks, just to like get that, um, get that in your head because we're gonna talk about it more. Disadvantages of vector data. And again, this is relative to raster data. Vector data can take a lot of computer memory. Um, they can take a lot of computer space, especially if we're dealing with uh, shape files that have you know, millions of points in them that will take a long time to load, uh, or even worse, you know, millions of little polygons, you know, defining land cover. If you download the land cover, the land use land cover layer for Massachusetts, it will take a long time to load and a long time to do anything with it um, in Arc Pro because yeah, the computer has to remember and translate not only the attributes of all of those polygons, but also the you know, specific location of millions of vertices defining the edges of all of those polygons. Raster data, conversely, all that the computer has to remember is, you know, where does this grid start? How many columns and rows in it are in it? And what are the numeric values associated with each of these pixels? So it has a lot less to remember. Um, when we're dealing with raster data. 
Another disadvantage of vector data is that, you know, rarely, I would say, are data continuous spatially. So you may have a whole bunch of different points in space, but in terms of, you know, dealing with a map display or in terms of trying to understand information, you know, like what, what's going on here, right? If I have no data in the middle of, uh, you know, in the middle of a map, that's, that's actually a common occurrence with vector data. Um, and so it can be a challenge in terms of both map display and trying to build inference for what's going on in that space where you have no information. Okay, uh, back to some refreshers of stuff that we talked about in lab uh, last week, which is joining. So remember, and this is, this is not just an ARC Pro thing. This is actually common in all sorts of databases. So um, no matter what, you know, whether you're building a database in some, you know, simple spreadsheets like Excel or whether you're using, uh, you know, so Microsoft has uh, software called Access that is like very specific for building databases and there's lots of other database programs. Um, relational databases are a common thing, which means that you don't store all of your data in one single gigundo spreadsheet because that takes a lot of memory. And if you're working in that particular spreadsheet a lot, there might be a whole bunch of different fields, a whole bunch of different columns that you don't need. And so you don't wanna spend computer processing time digesting all of that information every time you need to manipulate a data set. So that's why relational data sets exist. That's why we have this join feature as something that you can do in ArcGIS, which is that you can take information from some other table, whether that's an Excel spreadsheet or a, um, a text table uh, or a CSV is a, is a common format that we use. Um, you can always bring those into GIS. Right, so in this case, this should look somewhat familiar for you guys who did lab, you know, for, from lab two. If we're talking about which column <laughs> should I use to join, this one's pretty obvious, right? Because they are both called capital zone underscore capital name, right? Um, and you can see that you have the same values in both of those. So if I'm trying to bring counts into my shape file, zone name is pretty obviously the, um, the field that I want to use to join those two, th two things together to bring counts into my uh, into a spatial framework. Um, but it's not always the case, and it won't always be the case, that your join field is labeled or identifiable as exactly the same thing. So take a second to look at this one and see if you can figure out what is the join field to connect uh, these two data sets. So you might notice a couple of things. Um, first is that there's an ID field in both of these, right? But if you actually look at the values in ID, over here, there are a bunch of numbers, and over here, there are a bunch of country codes. Um, so even though they're called the same thing, those two columns, they do not contain information that is the same. And you need, in order to join things, you need to have information that is the same in both of uh, your fields. So in this case, actually, the fields that look the same are what's called team one in this one and ID over here. Um, so that's just a, a reminder that you can join things that don't have the same field name. They could be different fields. It's also a reminder that anytime that you're going to execute a join, you should always open the tables first, right? First open the attribute table of the shape file that you're using, and then open the table of whatever it is that you're gonna join to it. Um, because otherwise, how do you know <laughs> what the field is that you want to use to put those two things together? Um, ArcGIS will be happy to suggest a field for you, but um, as a general rule, don't trust the ArcGIS defaults because they will often lead you astray. So look first and then decide how do I put these things together? 
The other thing in terms of a review refresher is that you now know, um, based on doing some different selections in lab two last week, you know how to select suitable areas based on attributes, right? So if I gave you a bunch of um, counties in uh, wherever this was, Portland, right? Or something like that. Um, and those counties had information about household income and age and condominiums and uh, percent professionals and annual spending on pets, then you could probably select some of those um, and find the ones that you know maximized all of the, the values of each of those. You don't yet know, I think, how to add a value for those, but we're gonna do that when we get to lab five in terms of, of editing. You do know how to add a field though, right? So you can add fields um, and enter information you know, associated with some of those things. And just in terms of a refresher on what we can do with selections, if we think about what questions we can answer with selections, um, the, I guess this is a pause point. <laughs> what questions do you think we can answer um, with uh, selections? So um, I will count to five and see if you can write down a couple of questions that you think we could answer. All right, or pause the video, right? What I think uh, in terms of what we can do in, uh, with answering questions with selections is we can essentially ask what features from this shapefile fit a certain um, attribute or distance criteria. So uh, that could be asking how many are there, you know, like how many schools fit this criteria? Um, and where are they? You know, like which ones? <laughs> where are they located? So all of that information is already in the shapefile, right? So you're looking within a set of data that already exist for how many fit a criteria, where are they, which ones are they, you know, tell me more about the ones that fit my specific criteria. Um, but you have to have existing features in order to select them, right? So we are not in any way creating new shape files or creating new features to describe or answer a particular problem. And so that's what's coming next. That's what we're going to do in lab three, um, which is focused on what we call geoprocessing. And that is uh, finding suitability based on location with all of these you know, kind of like bubbles, which we're going to refer to as buffers um, around different features to define areas that are more suitable. Um, in this case, you know, whereas the last picture, if you remember, this is from the doggy daycare example. Um, it, in the last picture, we already had sort of like predefined, I'll go back to that, predefined shapes that were associated with census data or block groups or something like that that we were selecting from. When we get to this one, you see the shapes change quite a bit and we're starting to see kind of blobby shapes around areas, around roads, um, evidently around parks and where competitors are and stuff like that. So just as an example, um, if we wanted to ask a question of we're going to build a new school in the city of Framingham, Massachusetts. So this is Framingham here. Um, and the only two pieces of information that the planning board has given us are the locations of open space. So those are all these green areas and the location of hazardous material sites. And so one very simple um, analysis here would be to say, well, we can't build on open spaces because those are reserved for conservation and recreation. And maybe we want the schools to be a ways away from hazardous material sites so that we don't have all of our school kids playing uh, you know, with radioactive materials or something like that. Um, so if we just wanted to answer that simple question, there's no way to select that, right? Those features don't already exist. That's something that we need to create anew with the data that we've been given. And the way that we do that is first, if we wanted to describe areas that are 
close to in this case, or conversely, you know, like not close to, right? So we can define either, you know, here's the shape that's close to buffers, but we can, you know, if what we're looking for is actually the space that's far away, then it means just removing this from consideration. So we've created a buffer in this case is just arbitrary 500 meters away from hazardous material sites. And then we already have our polygon for open spaces. So if we just want to do a real simple analysis and say, I want to, I want all the gray areas, all of these possible build sites that are not open spaces and not within 500 meters of um, a hazardous material site, um, then you're going to learn how to create that. So there's a tool that's called an erase, <laughs> which means take away these other polygons from my starting polygon, from my starting town shape um, was previously gray, now it's purple. Um, and those are all areas that are neither in open space nor within 500 meters of a hazardous material site. So that's a warm up uh, for a lab this week of things that you're going to be thinking about. You're going to be doing lots of buffering of features um, and you're going to be learning about clips and erases uh, in geoprocessing. And I just want to close with a tip for today, which is GIS layer files. So typically when you open, this should say Arc Pro, but when you open the the opening screen and you drag in your Massachusetts counties, you might get something that looks like this. It might be a different color. ARC actually chooses a random color um, from a specific color palette for your uh, points, lines, and polygons as they, as they come in. Um, but let's say I spent a whole bunch of time, you know, looking at population or something like that, uh, or land area for each of these different counties. And I made all of these beautiful, giant, bulbous, uh, pink things on top of my orange and white hashing. And I'm really proud of this cartography um, that I have created. And I want to make sure that when I send you counties of Massachusetts, that you can easily recreate this beautiful cartography. So I could do that by saving the ARC Pro project, right? The um, .aprx file, but that would save all of the files within the project. So if I was working with a bunch of other stuff, it would also save, you know, various other things. If I just want to save this specific shape file and the, the cartography that I have designed um, for it, then the way that you do that is uh, to save it as a layer file. And uh, this is a right click on the data layer. So you can see here's the symbology. I cut off a bunch of other stuff that's above this, but you should, be, you should recognize symbology and properties that you see in a right click. Sharing is in between those. And so under sharing, you can save it as a layer file. Um, the benefit of that is that you can um, you know, zip together all of, your, all of the files associated with your shape file along with the layer file. The layer file needs to have the shape file too. So the, all that the layer file does is say, see this shape file over here? I'm gonna point to it. When you open that with using me, the layer file, then I'm gonna make it pink with orange stripes. Um, it does not contain any other data. It just points to data the same way that the, the Arc Pro project file does. Um, I think I already said this, so it's just pointing to spatial data. Um, it doesn't actually contain data. This is true of both layer files as well as the ARC Pro project files. But in both cases, so in the case of a layer file, it tells ARC Pro, here's how you display this one. Uh, it could be a raster grid too. It's not just vector data, raster or vector data set. In terms of a project, your ARC Pro project file, that says, here's how to display lots of different layer files together, you know, on my map. Um, if you're using a particular layer file or a particular data set repeatedly, or if you want to, you know, let's say you have five different data sets that are sort of like different versions of the same thing, like the same map, but for uh, different species, and you want to display them using the same exact graduated color scheme, uh, layer files are a great way to do that because you can import uh, into your symbology from not just the layer file um, 
associated with a specific shapefile, but you can import that layer file to other shapefiles as well. So if you're using a data file repeatedly and you want that symbology, um, you want it symbolized in a particular way, or if you're trying to copy the symbology to multiple files, layer files are a good way to go. All right, that's it for me, and I will uh, see you in lab this week. <laughs>